Okay, I, I got to say, uh, we've got a great one today. You know him from, <laughs> I, I had to take that line from you. You sure. know him from his time on Saturday Night Live, and then later as a United States Senator from Minnesota, Al Franken, thanks so much for coming on. You bet. Pleasure to be on, Brian. So let's start off uh, right off the bat with a Republican convention full of you know, lies and the lying liars who tell them, to, to, to borrow a phrase. Uh, mm-hmm. Do you think that the, the suburban housewives that Republicans are trying to reach are... Uh, buying the, the, the frothing lies of the RNC, you know, that, that Democrats want to abolish the suburbs and send our jobs to China and then end the Second Amendment and eliminate all borders, and you know? Yeah, uh, you know, suburban women. Uh, suburban women in 2018 uh, voted on health care. And that's why we picked up 41 swing districts. Um, we have to carry that message to them. They're, you know, they're obviously uh, the couple from uh, St. Louis, uh, the Brandishers, as I call them, Mr. and Mrs. Brandish. Um, <laughs> they, uh, they actually said, right, they're going to abol- get rid of the suburbs, <laughs> that we we're going to eliminate <laughs> the suburbs. Was that it? Um, eliminate the suburbs, eliminate borders. I mean, there was a point at the convention where, where they were saying that, uh, you know, we're out here to dismantle babies and sell them for parts. I mean, like, you know, you, yeah, the, that, the, the that, line that between Biden reality and- was for ripping a uh, baby just before birth. I mean, out of the womb. Yeah. Yeah. And look there. Yeah. You and I can talk. We should, we should go through the lies, but there is this, this, this thing, which I'm not sure that's sufficient <laughs> to go through their line because we do that. And uh, you see that the, the, the problem now seems to be that there are people get their media from very different places. So probably the people that are going to be watching this and listening to this are maybe already convinced that they lie. I mean, it's hard to be. So the question is, when I was watching this is, well, I'm obviously a stickler on facts. That's why I wrote Lies and Lying Liars Who Tell Them, A Fair and Balanced Look at the Right. And that's why I wrote Rush Limbaugh's Big Fat Idiot and Other Observations. <laughs> and I, that's why I wrote The Truth with Jokes. And that's, that's kind of what I do. I mean, that's one of the things I, yeah. I've done. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it's, I'm kind of interested in the lies that haven't really been covered that much. Um, I'm from Minnesota. One of the things he's talked about is uh, how tough he's been on China. And he really has bungled, in, in, in my opinion, how he's dealt with China. And he says this all the time. And he did say it in, at the convention. He said it in Charlotte uh, in his uh, acceptance speech after the delegates voted him unanimously renominated him. He said that um, that the Chinese have paid tens of billions of dollars in tariffs. Now, have you heard him say that? Yes, numerous times. That's no, they haven't paid a cent. The the country sending you goods, they're sending Chinese TVs that Best Buy is bringing in. Best Buy pays the tariff. Which they don't pay. pass on to, which <laughs> then pass on to the American consumer. Right. They don't sell that many TVs. You know, those are, that's South Korea and Japan. We used to sell them a whole bunch of soybeans and corn because we have a huge surplus that we can ship to places like China in soybeans and corn. Well, that was their retaliation, was putting sanctions on that. And what happened? Our farm economy just went completely south. And we saw farmers committing suicide. First tranche to farmers did not by any any means make farmers whole was $12 billion. That was our taxpayers' money that we were paying for his boneheaded sanctions the way he did that with China. 
But that's a lie. He says it all the time that China has yeah. paid these billions and billions and tens of billions of dollars in tariffs. They haven't paid a cent. And it has an effect on the lives of people who were Trump voters and shouldn't be Trump voters. And those are the, the farmers in Minnesota. It might almost be better to, you know, to, to focus on, on, like you said, on, on things like this that have a material impact on people as opposed to, you know, I know, I know the lies like, uh, you know, a, a eliminating all borders and abolishing the suburbs are, are, are sexier because they're just that much more insane, right? But they're scaring people. It's fear. Uh, obviously, right. that's, that's a big play. That's their big, one of their big plays is, is scaring people to death. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the entire RNC is just basically predicated on fear porn. But, but I was talking about suburban women, okay? Yeah. Healthcare. So uh, the press secretary, uh, Kaylee uh, McEnany, uh, gave a very personal speech uh, at the convention. You saw it. It was about a pre existing condition that she had, which is a uh, hereditary thing about her uh, uh, inheriting the propensity to get breast cancer. And, you know, it was a very personal story, appreciated that. The thing is, it was supposed to be her story on pre-existing conditions, <laughs> on how the president cares so much about pre-existing conditions. Except in 2017, when I was there and voted against the Republican Senate bill and saw what was going on in the house, what their bills were. None of those bills protected people with pre-existing conditions. The only thing we have uh, protecting coverage for pre-existing conditions, the only thing that, 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 that protects us right now is the ACA. And they're exactly. right now suing to overturn it, to dismiss They're suing it. to overturn it, exactly. And, um, you know, remember he said in 16 that he was going to repeal and replace uh, the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, he said, was something terrific, something terrific. Well, uh, he didn't do that. Remember promises made, promises kept? Yeah. You know, um, Mexico, first of all, he hasn't built the wall, and the non-existent wall, Mexico hasn't paid for that. That was paid for by Bannon and his contributor. <laughs> right, right. Or, or what little they, they uh, allocated to the wall when they were done with the, with the yachts and, the, and paying off their credit card debt. And I tweeted, tax. I tweeted that, uh, that uh, Bannon and the other, uh, uh, the other crooks at uh, the uh, We Build the Wall had actually knocked down two miles of the wall and re and resold the rebar <laughs> on Craigslist. And a lot of people believed it. This is what happened. <laughs> that, you tweet something like that and about really, that's terrible. <laughs> yeah. So there's nothing, there's nothing that they can do that people that just go, oh, that is yeah. just awful. That is awful that they did that. Uh, but yeah, no, they, and then, and then when uh, McCain did the thumbs down, he he actually said this: "Who knew healthcare was complicated? Everyone, schmuck, everyone." <laughs> and uh, so, you know, pretty much everything said there is a lie. I mean, he went after China and he went after the Bidens of China. He was introduced by his daughter, who's gotten, I, I believe it's 18 trademarks from the Chinese. Yeah. From his good friend, Xi. It, it's, uh, you know, it, it it's going to. It's going to be scary. This is very frightening. And he's playing the fear card big time. He's acting as if this chaos that President Biden has caused this chaos. Right. And, uh, okay, you know, you're the president. Like you're saying, I mean, these things, the, you know, from, from Kaylee McEnany's lie 
to um, to the you know the economy and the tariffs lie to you know of course all of the big lie is 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 COVID right that's the big lie so so clearly the goal of the RNC is to distract people from the, in this country from, from the principal issue that we're facing right now, which is the pandemic that's killed 180,000 Americans and continues to kill 1,000 people a day. So do you think that you know, the, the, the blatant misdirection efforts are helping or hurting them? I don't know. And I don't think that, you know, I saw, I've seen a lot of commentary saying, oh, you know, people aren't buying. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, we'll see some, whether they get some bump from this. We don't know if people get bumps anymore from conventions, but we'll, uh, we shall see. Um, I, you know, th- this uh, fear, the city is exploding, the, you know, um, that is what they're, they're counting on. But the, the pandemic, of course, is the big lie, and they lied. They just lie about that. And so it was, he saved millions of lives. Really? Uh, uh, First of all, we have 4% of the world's uh, population and 25% of the fatalities. I don't think he saved millions of lives. I don't think that- The crazy part about that is he gives that example, you know, as if it's, it's this shining example of his heroism, but his having, you know, quote unquote, saved millions of lives is in the event that he had done nothing at all. As if, you know, the, the, the bar, as if the bar for the president of the United States is to do nothing, but if he deigns to do something at all, the bare minimum, then he's a hero. And so because he took whatever, you know, minimal steps. Well, he, he, first of all, he denied that there was a problem for two months. Right. So that alone is responsible for tens and tens of thousands of deaths, not doing anything. And it wasn't like he wasn't told in his presidential daily brief. And it wasn't like Azar didn't go to him and tell him what or didn't tell him what the what the day what what it was. And he actually called Azar an alarmist and said, I don't want to talk about that. What I want to uh, talk about is um, smoking the uh, vaping. I want to talk about vaping. Mm-hmm. And I, it, it's, it, I, I'm really mad that kids can't uh, vape bubblegum flavored <laughs> <laughs> um, nicotine. <laughs> and, and literally, that was Azar's meeting with him. This is going to kill potentially hundreds of thousands of people. You're an alarmist. I want to talk about how mad I am about uh, the ban on vaping of these flavors. Joni Ernst, who uh, my, was my colleague and uh, is currently uh, still, uh, she's running for re-election in Iowa. She said that uh, in 2014, when she was running then, that Obama had displayed a failure of leadership on Ebola, and two people, two Americans died on Ebola. <laughs> okay, in Texas, yeah. Yeah. in Dallas, at the hospital where they screwed up. Okay, uh, and that was a tragedy. Uh, but it was two two people, and so Dana Bash on CNN said to her, "Okay, uh, you said <laughs> that uh, President Obama showed a failure of leadership." on Ebola and we lost two Americans. We've lost now, and I think at that point it was 160,000 Americans. You think Trump has displayed a failure in leadership. And then she went into a good, I don't know, two minute uh, blah, blah, blah on uh, wearing masks and social distancing (laughs) and stuff like that. Finally, Dana Bash said, okay, okay, okay let her, did that thing where you let him speak, and I don't know why they do that. Anyway, <laughs> at that point, and she said, but, and she said, has Trump shown a failure in leadership? And she said, no. Uh, the, it's, my former Republican colleagues have been the worst kind of enablers, and it's all been fear. It's all been fear of, They'll lose their jobs if 
they do anything and that Trump will go after them and they'll get primaried and they should pay a price for this. We obviously need to elect President Biden and give him a majority in the Senate. And then we can start to, first of all, heal this wounded nation. This has been, you know, I've, I'm 69 years old. I've been around for assassinations, for Vietnam, uh, for 9-11, uh, the war in Iraq, obviously. Uh, this is the darkest period I think I can remember. I was around for the civil rights fight. This is so dark right now. One, 180,000 Americans and counting. But, and, but also people at home, trapped at home. Kids not able to go to school. Um, you know, I have, I have four grandchildren, um, three of them who have been doing virtual learning. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen this fall. Uh, it'd be great. You know, it, it's, it's damaging both ways. And this did not have to happen. All, it, I, I wrote a piece called uh, How a Malignant Narcissist could have successfully handled uh, the coronavirus. And I basically say that a malignant narcissist of merely average intelligence would have known that handling this would have reassured his reelection. And we didn't have that. We didn't have that. And it's on him. It is all on him. We would have had a pandemic no matter what. We've had a global pandemic. We would have had it. We didn't have to have an out of control pandemic. The disadvantage of, for him of that is like you said, and I don't think anybody doubts the fact that we would have had a pandemic. And of course, no one is saying that the pandemic in and of itself is Donald Trump's fault, but obviously the way he handled it is his fault. And you know, we have the benefit, so to speak, of being able to look at every other country in the world and see how they handled it. So it's not like we live in a vacuum, right? We can look right up north at Canada. We can look at New Zealand. We can look at South Korea and Germany and all these other countries who handled it successfully, who did it, you know, who, who put the work in to contain the spread, who enacted, um, you know, created a nationwide testing and contact tracing system, who created enough PPE, produced enough PPE uh, for, their, for their frontline workers, who instituted um, nationwide mask mandates and who advocated for stay-at-home orders as opposed to politicized masks, as opposed to foment protests against uh, stay-at-home orders, you know? And did contact tracing and isolation. They did what you're supposed to do. They listened to the scientists instead of their, their son-in-law. And, um, and, and, and also because the man will not admit a mistake, he continues to say, well, it, it's, I, no, I stand by, it will disappear. <laughs> and the sun will disappear in about 4 billion years. Mm. It'll burn, it'll run out of the hydrogen. It'll explode and it'll be this red star that goes out actually past the earth. I mean, it'll envelop uh, the, the, the first three planets. And that's when the coronavirus will be gone. <laughs> They'll die then. So uh, my fear is, you know, there was a lot of screaming about last night about the Hatch Act. We're not going to win this election on people who are scandalized <laughs> by him violating the Hatch Act. And I looked at that last night and I went like, there's a lot of Americans that are going to look at that and go like, gosh, that is just gorgeous. That is that's presidential. That's it. You know, we had, I thought Biden gave a fabulous speech. I thought that was the best speech of the convention, frankly, because it was the yeah. most important speech. And, uh, and, and I thought, you know, there were a lot of great speeches. Um, but that one was the most important speech. And I thought it was great. And we're going to see whether people respond to one guy directly in the camera telling what he wants to do and also talking about 
bringing people together and versus uh, what we saw last night. And I am, I am not sure which prevails and I will see, we'll, we'll see, but he will do anything to win this election. When you say, um, if I don't win, that means it was rigged is basically a way of saying, I can't win without cheating. That's really what he's saying. And he's going to in any way he can. He's doing it right and, now. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's already doing it. It's already happening. Yeah. And I think fun. that we, I think people have taken the eye off the ball of Russia because, you know, people say that the Russians will be back. They've never left. And they were in our voting registration. They were in uh, our our apparatus for voting. And I'm very afraid of that. And of course, Moscow Mitch, why he's called Moscow Mitch is that he has not funded uh, the, the proper surveillance of, of uh, and technical response to the Russians. Well, let me ask you this. Um, I just want to switch gears to, to something that you were speaking about a little earlier, and that was, you know, taking back, uh, taking back the Senate and, and obviously the presidency. In a situation where we are able to flip the Senate, I feel like the thing that always happens is that Democrats are the ones who, you know, decide that we have to take the high road and, and that we're the ones who have to unify. So, so basically, in the Republicans' ideal world, um, they get to move things as far right as humanly possible. I mean, basically, you know, destroy the institutions of government and, and bend them to their will. And on the left, in our ideal world, it's, it's, it's unity, it's compromise. And that, that's what it seems to be so often. You know, like when, when Republicans are in power, the things that they accomplish for themselves are just bananas, you know? And the things that Democrats try to do, they screech about, and then when the tables are turned, uh, they're doing the same thing 10 times worse. So in the event that we do take the Senate, do you think that there will be, um, you know, deference to, to compromise? Or do you think that finally we would see some type of aggressive push to, to enact our agenda, an aggressive push to, you know, bring Puerto Rico on as the 51st state, to abolish the filibuster, to uh, uh, pass, uh, you know, a new Voting Rights Act, to to pass the Green New Deal, to all of, you know, everything on our democratic wish list. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? I think we will move to get rid of the filibuster. It's going to go sooner or later. Uh, you've seen Mitch McConnell break pretty much every rule. The most egregious, of course, was not giving Merrick Garland a hearing. And, uh, you know, he, he has said... Just a couple months ago, he was asked if, uh, if, if vacancy comes up in the Supreme Court during this year, would you, you know, uh, hear, nominate uh, a nomination? Would you have hearings and uh, confirm a replacement? And not only did he say yes, he said it with a sly smile. Right. And, of course, that's as cynical as you can get. They eliminated the blue slip. Uh, I know that you know that. I don't know if all of your uh, listeners and viewers do. The blue slip was something that had been in place for over 100 years, which gave senators from states from the uh, opposite party of the uh, president uh, a veto on federal judges for their state. And... It, it was actually ended on me, a uh, judge, a judge that was going to be in the Minnesota, uh, our, our judge in a uh, federal judge in a, uh, in a circuit court. And what that, what that had done is you, it, now Republicans had been vetoing like Ted Cruz, they just had not done what you normally would do, which is appoint some committee in your state of, a bipartisan committee of legal the lawyers in your state and find someone who's respected of the president's party 
And that's what I wanted to do, find a Republican. But I'd find, we'd find someone who's very well respected. And that's why up until now, the federal judiciary has been a very respected institution. They ruined that. They are just putting through people who are just not qualified and ideologues. And we're not going to reinstitute the blue slip. So they ruined the federal court, really, for the rest of the time. We're, we're not going to put unqualified ideologues on. We're going to put, you know, progressives who are qualified. <laughs> but uh, th this, they have done incredible damage to the institution of the Senate, the institution of the presidency. And I fear what will happen if we don't win both the White House and the Senate. Well, I feel like, you know, and, and putting aside all of the things that, that, that all of the points of hypocrisy from Trump, um, I guess the broader question is, how does the country come back for the, from this? Like in the event that, that Biden wins, because if, if Trump wins, I, I, I don't think we come back from this. But if Biden wins, is there a way back to normalcy? Are you talking about unifying people? There, there's going to be, if Trump loses... He's going to, you know, lead the resistance and he'll go on, what is it, AON? Is that the network? AON, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he'll, he'll take that over and he'll be aggrieved. He'll say it was stolen. And uh, th this is not, we're not going to be healed as a nation completely at all, at all. Hopefully, um, you know, we're going to be able to do the kinds of things that most Americans want. Most Americans want us to build on the Affordable Care Act, not, not get rid of it. Most Americans understand that climate change is a real thing. They want us to rejoin the Paris Accords and they want us to. And those are jobs. I mean, did Trump add any coal jobs in, in the three and a half years? No, of course not. Uh, those are, are real jobs. And in retrofitting, why did not just retrofit our buildings that are not energy efficient? There's a lot of manufacturing in that. There's a lot of jobs in that. There's, you save a tremendous amount of energy. Why Americans want our infrastructure to resemble that of the rest of the developed world. They, they would like it. <laughs> our airports and roads and bridges and railroads, for God's sakes, to just even resemble the rest of, of the developed world. There's lots of things we want to do. And again, I, I, we're going to have to get rid of the filibuster. There's no question about that in my mind. And um, we're... Uh, but it's going to be rough. This guy is so invested in tearing people apart that, man, he's, he's not going away. Well, let me ask, do you think that the future of the Republican Party resembles more closely, you know, a Don Jr. or a Nikki Haley? And that's not to normalize Nikki Haley, because I, I, I don't think that she uh, deserves normalization. But, but, you know, in terms of the the you know, the extremist versus what the Republican version of a moderate is? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I, I do know that uh, his base is his base. And it has become the party of Trump. I love their platform was uh, whatever he wants. <laughs> And I, I don't know if you saw this interview he had with Sean Hannity, where Sean Hannity asked him what his goals were for a second term, and he had nothing. He had nothing. In fact, he was asked that question four times. He had four attempts on Fox News, and every time it was just this rambling diatribe of just words falling out of his mouth and, you know, with no real through line. And, and he, he never gave an answer. We, we've, we've had four attempts and even the convention, you know, the, the convention was his opportunity to, to, um, to give his vision for, for Trump's America. And his vision was don't elect Joe Biden because everything that's happening in Trump's America will happen in Joe Biden's America. 
look at Biden's America. There's rioting in the streets. There's, <laughs> you know, how the guy, when he did the uh, uh, Mount Rushmore speech, I was on uh, one of the MSNBC shows and I was asked about that. And I said, I thought he had the racists. I thought he had them. But evidently, there's a whole untapped group of racists that didn't vote in, in 16. And uh, the fear that, again, the brandishers uh, brought and just uh, some of the speeches, they were so apocalyptic. They're going to lock you in your homes. The fear porn is what they rely on. You know, I don't think that this party... The, the problem with the Republican Party is that it's it's so predicated on this like this Fox News fear mongering that when they actually have the chance to govern, they don't they're not prepared to govern because their entire brand is predicated on just scaring people into not electing Democrats. And they never got to the second part, which is what to do when they're in power. Look what the uh, that Han did at the FDA on convalescent uh, plasma. He lied <laughs> the head of the fda so that trump could present this as, uh, as like another miracle cure like hydroxychloroquine and he 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 allowed that to go out too we europe is not going to take our products you know minnesota has a big medical device industry those have to be approved by the fda Europe is not going to take our pharmaceuticals. They're not going to take our medical devices. If the head of, if the commissioner of the FDA is lying. I don't even think Americans are going to take our products. I don't, well, that's, I don't think here is the, the, the huge danger of this. Last night he said, we're going to have a vaccine by the end of the year, probably sooner. Of course, he's going to announce it for the election. Who's going to take that vaccine? I mean, you know, do you, and you know, between hydroxychloroquine and, and uh, you know, uh, drinking uh, Clorox, and th this guy is ridiculous. And no, you know, and we have enough anti-vaxxers as it is. But would you take it, or would you? Uh, you know, you're young, so. I don't. I wouldn't recommend it being the first one to take this. <laughs> and it's a legitimate question because uh, because obviously, like you know, I'm the, I'm the furthest thing from an anti vaxxer But but you've seen what he's what he's done to our CDC and the FDA, and you you can see right off the bat. I mean, they just uh, they just changed the guidelines that said that you don't have to be that you don't have to be tested if you're not showing symptoms. Well, that was the whole issue in the beginning is that you can spread this thing asymptomatically, and so if you don't test people who aren't showing symptoms, then you're missing out on a huge swath of people who are still infected with this virus. That's what allowed this thing to explode in this country in the first place. So, you know, it's, it's a good question. And, and of course, you know, I don't want to be the, I'd be the last person to say, don't take this vaccine, but I'm not going to stick something in my body that I don't, that I don't uh, think is safe, you know, and I don't think anybody else would either. And I'm definitely not going to do it to appease the ego of somebody who's trying to, to shoehorn a virus, uh, to shoehorn a vaccine and to help himself politically. The, the number one thing that a president, asset that a president can bring to a crisis is trust and credibility. And he had squandered that long, long time before this crisis, obviously, by lying all the time. And, but he's just continued to do that throughout this. You know, remember... Early on at the CDC, he said, anybody wants a test can get one. And the fact is, is that you have to wait so long to find out the results of your test that it really almost borders on useless. Uh, it, th this has been handled so criminally and the result is, I mean, this is 180,000 and counting. And we know where it's going. And it isn't like he's a guy who can't admit a mistake. So there's been no like, okay, 
uh, really should have, <laughs> we really should be working hard at developing a test that as an instant, you know, you get a result right away. We really should do uh, uh, contact tracing. We really should isolate people. You know, Andy Slavitt, uh, the former uh, head of uh, Medicare and Medicaid under Obama, and Scott Gottlieb, who is head of the FDA pri prior for Trump's, this is bipartisan, months ago, put together a plan to do exactly what I was talking about, which is to do contact tracing and then isolation, including taking people who have tested positive and isolating them in a hotel. We, we've seen these hotels going, you know, going under or uh, suffering, uh, having no business. It, and put a workforce together of, uh, you know, 180,000 people who would be going, literally going door to door or contacting people. And this is how, this is how you do that. This is how we eradicated smallpox. That's how you do it. And um, that was bipartisan. A lot of people signed on to that. Um, nope, didn't do it. It's, it's uh, and that would have more than paid for itself. It was like $45 billion, but more, more than many times over. And everyone has to remember the economic cost of this. We talk about the, the, the human cost in, in terms of tragedy. There's human cost in terms of the economic cost. Uh, people are, you know, tens of millions out of work. Uh, the, the, the gap, the, this has exposed, the, the, the pandemic has exposed many of the weaknesses in, in our society. Uh, the gap between those who are uh, white collar, high income, or upper income versus the essential workers that have to go to the grocery store and man that and, and who are uh, the, the black and brown people who are disproportionately the ones who are, who are dying. This, this, has, this has shown a lot of the weaknesses in our country that have to be addressed. And that's that's what Biden should be talking about as well. And he, and he will be. So let's uh, let's switch over to you for a little bit. Um, How did you go from Saturday Night Live uh, to the Senate, which isn't necessarily known for uh, humor or or joy um, yeah. and, and not lose your mind? Well, um, I had my eye on the prize. Uh, also. So there was some intervening years. I, I did the years I did at SNL were I was one of the original writers from seventy five to eighty. Left when Lauren left, came back. I was a Lauren again writer, so I came back in uh, eighty five and went till ninety five. And then after that, I think when I left, uh, when I left SNL, the first thing I did was write uh, was write uh, Rush Limbaugh's a big fat idiot and other observations. And that was about lying. And it was about, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that Rush Limbaugh got the Presidential Medal of Freedom is no coincidence. That without Rush Limbaugh, there'd probably be no President Donald Trump. And um, my next big New York Times number one bestseller was Lies and Lying Liars Who Tell Them, A Fair and Balanced Look at the Right, which of course was pretty much the same thing, but with a focus on Fox um, and, uh, and and other right-wing wires. And uh, so, and then, and then I, I was doing it, then I did Air America, which was, uh, you know, the number one rated uh, progressive uh, radio show for three years. And then I ran for the Senate. I did some yeah. stuff yeah. in between. I had kids. I have grandchildren now. <laughs> and uh, but when I ran for the Senate, I um, I in in large part ran because uh, Paul Wellstone was a friend of mine. Uh, after he died, uh, very shortly before 
uh, the election in, in 2002. Um, Norm Coleman was elected. And not long after, he said, to be blunt, after he was in office like two months, and he said, to be blunt, I'm a 99% improvement over Paul Wellstone. And I said, hmm, I wonder who's going to beat him. Would you run for office again? Uh, I, I'm not considering that. I, I, I loved my job in the Senate. It was the best job I ever had. I, I started my uh, Al Franken giant of the Senate, the ironically now named um, uh, uh, memoir. Uh, I started by saying a lot of people have asked me, is being senator as much fun as working on Saturday Night Live? And I said, the answer, of course, is no. <laughs> but it's the best job I ever had. So I, uh, I really love doing that. I love working for the people of Minnesota. Um, so I don't know. I, I don't know. All right, Al, where, where, where can my viewers and listeners find you? Uh, there's this thing called podcasts. I think that you're familiar <laughs> with. And uh, if you have an app for them, as they say, wherever you get your podcasts, there's the Al Franken podcast. You can also find me on YouTube every once in a while, like you. I don't have the, uh, the audience on my YouTube yet. Yet. I've been watching you now. You're smart. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. Well, if you're watching this and you're on YouTube, uh, you know, go on over to Al's page. Yeah. Subscribe to my page. But the, yeah, the podcast uh, is uh, the Al Franken podcast. It's an eponymous uh, podcast. Meaning it's, 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 well, you understand now in context what everyone listening and watching understands what eponymous means. But my, my listeners, my podcast knew what eponymous meant even before that because they're very well-educated affluent, <laughs> <laughs> which is very good. This is really just a message for uh, possible sponsors Yeah, for, the podcast, <laughs> right. for more sponsors. Yeah, my, That's my, my your, your your podcast audience is very a very affluent, uh, loyal. evenly split, evenly split male female uh, in the in the uh, in the coveted uh, twenty five to forty five demo. Yes, <laughs> I actually don't know, but I I uh, I would recommend your podcast to folks, but you're listening to it now probably. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or watching it on the yes, but I may. And um, so, uh, yeah, check it out. And there's, uh, there's a big backlog of them. Uh, the next one to drop is Axelrod. He drops nice. on uh, uh, David Axelrod. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, it's great. All right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> say, I'm sorry, say again. <laughs> for a change. Every, <laughs> what you were referring to for your listeners and viewers is that at the start I, I always say well we've got a great one today you know for a change and then um, <laughs> and that's become my signature yeah I guess and uh, but enough for me, enough for me to have uh, to have gleaned it and, and stolen it and using it used it for this one yeah yeah so thanks for the homage the, mm -hmm. uh, there and uh, thanks for having me it's been very very fun, and uh, congratulations on all of your success doing this and for what you contribute to the di dialogue. And you're an explainer. I like that. We need explainers. And so on your YouTube, very often it's just you take, uh, <laughs> you, take uh, you know, the uh, uh, Chris Wallace interview <laughs> with Trump and then explain you take a piece of it and then explain it. My favorite part, of course, was him bragging about passing a dementia test. Yep. And, uh, you know, usually, usually you don't hear people brag about passing dementia tests. And usually they don't give you one if you're really operating on all cylinders. They don't go like, Mr. President, you have been sharp as a tack lately. You know, it'd be fun to see if you can identify an elephant. <laughs> right. <laughs> what? 
Yeah. So your explainers are great. Oh, thanks. Well, Al Franken, thanks so much for, for coming on. We really appreciate it. Hey, Brian, thank you. Thank you.